Krishna. I sincerely welcome everyone to Sri Radha Gopinath Temple, especially my very dear senior godbrother Nara Narayan Prabhu, very close associate of Srila Prabhupada. Let us welcome him very enthusiastically back to our humble temple. And I believe Sukavaha Devi Prabhu is also somewhere here. Are you downstairs? Well, let us welcome her so she can hear us wherever she may be. Today, according to our Vaishnav calendar, it is the disappearance day of Udharandat Thakur. With your permission, I will speak a few words about him. Do I have your permission? With your permission comes your blessings and with your blessings the empowerment for me to speak. It is a divine reality that is beyond the purview of the mind senses or intelligence to comprehend how Krishna can work. If the audience is eager to hear about Krishna, to purify their hearts, Krishna can speak through someone who may not be so qualified just to deliver all of you. Krishna's ways are transcendentally perfect. Srila Prabhupada as we were speaking during the book distribution marathon festival. He was saying to the assembly of his devotees how thankful he was to them. And he said, because you are helping me to execute the order of my, the mission of my spiritual master. I consider all of you the representatives of my Guru Maharaj. And with a choked voice, he extended his sincerest, most profound and humble gratitude. Whenever Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appears within this world, once in a day of Brahma, with him comes Lord Nityananda Prabhu. And his eternal associates, so many of them from Goloka Vrindavan. Narutam Das Thakur has sung Brajandra Nandana Jai Sachi Shuta Hoilo Say Balaram Hoilo Nitai 
that the son of Nanda has appeared as the son of Sachi, and Balaramji has come as Lord Nityananda Prabhu. Nityananda Prabhu's mercy is beyond any other avatar. Parama Karuna Pahundui Jana Nitai Gora Chandra. These two lords, Chaitanya and Nityananda Prabhu, they are supremely kind, supremely merciful. Aha Prabhu Nityananda Premananda Suki. Narottam Das Thakur sings. Nityananda Prabhu is always intoxicated in prem or ecstatic love. He is the source of the Purusha avatars, Karuna Dakshai Vishnu, Kshiro Dakshai Vishnu, Garbo Dakshai Vishnu, as well as Shesha and Mula Sankarshan. Well, when he appears, just like Balaramji would become intoxicated when taking his Varuni, Nityananda Prabhu was constantly intoxicated with the ecstasy of love of God, especially as he would glorify Lord Chaitanya by chanting his holy names. Because of this intoxicated state, he made no distinction between who was good and who was bad. People who have mundane intoxication, you know how they lose their discrimination? Sometimes very proper lords and ladies from very high cultured families, they act like complete fools when they're intoxicated. They just lose their discrimination. Well, that is a very gross, perverted reflection. But Nityananda Prabhu, he was so intoxicated with Krishna Prem, he did not discriminate who was fit or who was unfit. Anyone who took shelter of him, he would give the highest perfection of life. And he offered that shelter to everyone. On Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's order, he and Haridas Thakur, they were going from house to house, shop to shop, bathing God to bathing God, person to person, pleading with everyone to take the name of Lord Chaitanya, to chant Hare Krishna, and become perfect. And anyone who took shelter with some faith, that's all he asked for. Just take shelter with some faith and I will give you the highest perfection. Dinahina yata chilo hari namu dhari dhara sakshi jagai madhai. He even gave to jagai and madhai. They were so drunk, so drunk on liquor, very horrible, mode of ignorance. They were murderers, thieves, rapists. They were burning houses down. They were killing cows with their own hands and just eating the flesh and putting it in their mouths. They were horrible demons. When Nityananda Prabhu approached Jagai and Madhai, all the people around warned him. They screamed at him, No, you are a fool. Don't go near them. They will kill you. They'll not listen. What nonsense. You're going to preach to them? But he could, when he heard all of that, he thought, oh, the more he heard how horrible they were, how dangerous they were, how sinful they were, the more enthused he was. The more he was told, you're going to die if you approach them, the more he was eager to approach them. That was Nityananda Prabhu. 
And along with Lord Nityananda Prabhu came his eternal associates from the spiritual world. And they were all expansions of his mercy. They all possessed the same mercy as him to help fulfill his mission. Amongst the associates of Nityananda Prabhu, the most prominent are the Dwadasa Gopals, the twelve Gopals, twelve cowherd boy associates from Goloka Vrindavan, who are always in the company of Krishna and Balaram. Kavikarnapul in Gora Ganodaishtapika describes how the cowherd boy Subahu appeared as Udharandat Thakur. He appeared in the year of 18, for, I'm sorry, 1481 in the town of Saptagram. Father is Srikara, mother Bhadravati. Now, Saptagram was a place of bankers and gold merchants. Very wealthy community, but exceedingly materialistic. They are called the Suvarna Vanik caste. They had lots of money. Sometime before the advent of Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda, there was a very powerful personality. His name was Balal Sain. And he knew where to get money from. From the Saptagram community, he took big, big loans from a gory Sain. But what happened is Gauri Sain saw that Balal Sain was extravagantly misusing the money. So he decided, I will not give him any more loans. Balal Sain was infuriated. And he created a whole social conspiracy. Can you imagine if he had access to internet? <laughs> <laughs> he made this whole conspiracy that the Suvarna Vaniks were outcasts. They were not Brahmin Kshatriya Vaishas, hardly Sutras. And in doing so, he actually succeeded to publicly ostracize the whole community of Saptagram from any respectability. People looked down at them. They were taken away religious, religious pri privileges. And they lived under that dark cloud for a long time. Udharanda Thakur, Subahu, the cowherd boy from Goloka, took birth in that family. Why? <laughs> Vrindavan Das Thakur explains that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu especially wanted to teach the world that Krishna consciousness is not dependent on any external superficial identity. And to make his statement very, very strong, he proclaimed the Namacharya to be Haridas Thakur, who was born in an outcast family. Sri Adwaitacharya, who was the head of all the Brahmins, most honored and respected, when he performed the Shraddha, all the greatest Brahmins would come to his house. It was a very prestigious event. I'm sure his wife, Sita Thakurani, made excellent prasad also. So, so everyone was coming. Many of all shradhas, that is very prestigious to Adwaitacharyas. 
to the high class scholars, pundits. And in front of all of them, he gave the highest honors. He worshipped Haridas Thakur. Powerful statement. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, how he praised Haridas Thakur as if he had many, many mouths. And how he empowered him. So similarly, Udharanda Thakur, he was born in this uh, very, very materialistic uh, class of men who were just utterly disrespected from a religious or spiritual perspective. But his love for Krishna, because he's a Vaishnav, because of his attachment to Lord Chaitanya, Lord Nityananda Prabhu, and the Holy Name, he not only delivered his entire caste, it is said that a Vaishnav, who has a pure heart, not only delivers his family, not only delivers his caste, or hers, but purifies the entire world. Not only the entire world, but purifies the entire universe. That is how Krishna manifests through the heart of his devotees. So, <clears throat> From Padma Purana, Prabhupada often quotes, Arche Vishnu Shiladira Guru Shu Naramatira Vaishnavi Jati Bhuti. That one who considers the deity to be made of stone or wood, the Guru to be an ordinary human being, the Vaishnav to belong to any particular caste or sect, the Charanamrit of either a devotee's foot or the Lord's lotus feet, which has the power to sanctify the heart, to consider that ordinary water, to consider the name of Vishnu an ordinary sound vibration, or to consider that anyone could be equal to Vishnu, that person, Naraka Bhuti, his, his mentality is not only presently hellish, but it's destined toward the same place. So, <clears throat> Offenses to the holy name, offenses to Vaishnavas, are therefore taken very seriously by Krishna. There is sin or papa, and there is aparad. Sin is immoral, unethical activities. Or mistreating ordinary common people. But aparad is when we mistreat the Supreme Personality of Godhead or his devotees, the Vaishnavas. Now, nam aparad means negligent chanting. The holy name is so powerful that even if we chant with nam nambasa, I'm sorry, nambasa, even if we chant with nambasa, negligently, not really understanding so well, still the power of the holy name can cleanse us of our sins and grant us liberation. If 
we don't commit offenses. And oftentimes, Ajamil is used as an example of such. Ajamil chanted. He didn't understand so much. He was so sinful, even though he was covered by sins. When he chanted the holy name, he was freed from his sins. He gained liberation. Why? Because he wasn't committing offenses. There were no aparads. Sins can easily be cleansed by the holy name. But we find repeated in the scriptures, aparads, very difficult. When Durvas Muni offended Ambarish, neither Indra or Brahma or Shiva or even Vishnu himself could save him. Only when there was a sincere repentant begging forgiveness to Ambarish could he be forgiven. In fact, the scriptures tell us that not only Krishna will not save you from offenses to Vaishnavas, even the Guru, the Guru cannot save you from offenses to Vaishnavas. He can instruct you, he can direct you, but if you commit those offenses, they're on you. And Krishna is going to take them very seriously. And if the guru is not very, very advanced, the disciples' offenses can even drag down the guru. That is how serious Vaishnava Aparad is. And while we're on the subject, I'll divert. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu wanted to make a very strong statement in this regard. And he used his own beloved mother as an example. Shall I tell the story? In the house of Srivas, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu on rare occasions would manifest his, his supreme identity as the Lord. And so one day, he sat on the throne of Vishnu and picked up the Shalagram Shilas and put them on his laps and manifested his opulence as a Supreme Lord. Generally, Lord Chaitanya, he wanted to teach us how to be a devotee by his example. So he lived like a devotee. And if anyone called him the Lord, he would hold his ears, block them with his hands, cry out, Vishnu, Vishnu, never call the living entity the Lord. We are always his eternal servants. But sometimes amongst his closest associates, he would fulfill their desires by manifesting his forms of the Lord and grant them all benedictions. On this day, people were asking for benedictions. My father, he's acting very strange. <laughs> he's not very favorable to my Krishna consciousness. Please deliver him, make him favorable. So be it, he will be favorable. So many benedictions. And Srivas Thakur, he asked for a benediction. Actually, he was just speaking out of affection. He said, my Lord, Please give your mother, Sachi, Krishna Prem. The devotees were not expecting his reply. He said, My mother, I have no power to give her Krishna Prem. <coughs> Out of the question, she has offended a Vaishnava. Huh? <laughs> devotees. Whatever happiness they had, seeing the Lord and getting all blessings for themselves, was finished. Because that's the nature of a devotee. More concerned with others than oneself. To the degree we're unselfish 
in our concern for other people to get Krishna's mercy, to that degree we're actually a Vaishnava. An envious person is willing, willing even to trample upon someone else for the purpose of prestige or power or influence or facilities. But a Vaishnava's greatest joy is to see others being empowered to see others being blessed, to see others getting the mercy of Guru and Krishna. And that's actually a way we can analyze how we're making spiritual progress. When someone else is being empowered, when someone else is successful, if we feel joy in that, just feeling that joy is so dear to Krishna, he will bless us unlimitedly. But if we feel envious, Krishna will discard us. That is the disease. So all the devotees, they were broken hearted. Srivas Thakur said, how, how can you say like this? She's your mother. <laughs> you lived in her womb for so many months. She nourished you. And when you came out of her womb, she, with her own milk, she fed you. She sacrificed her whole life for you, only you. How could anyone speak like this about their own mother? Even if she may have made an offense, how could she make an offense? But even if she's made an offense, you have to forgive her, she's your mother. Lord Chaitanya said, no, she has made an aparad against Advaita. Only Advaita can forgive her if she wants Krishna Prema. So the devotees, along with Sachi Mata, called Advaita Charya. Advaita Charya came in. And uh, Sachi Mata was hiding. She was hiding in a secret place waiting for the opportune moment. And Srivas and the devotees said, please forgive, um, forgive Sachi Mata, she offended you. <laughs> and Adoita Sharya, me? Forgive Sachi Mata? You want me to let her touch my feet? Impossible, unthinkable. Can't even, can't even conceive of this. She's the mother of my Lord and my master. She's the embodiment of devotion. I know who she is. She's, she's Mother Ganga. She's Mother Yashoda. She's Kosalya. She's Devaki. She's the eternal mother of the Supreme Lord. She's my worshipable deity in my heart. I should be taking dust from her lotus feet. The dust from her lotus feet will purify the entire universe. And as he was describing the glories of Sachimata, he went into such an ecstatic trance, he fell to the ground unconscious. Immediately, Sachimata ran out and put her head on, and put her head on his lotus feet. And he was not aware of any of it. He was, in, he was unconscious, glorifying Sachimata. And as Sachimata had his feet on her head, feeling his glories, she began to glorify Adoitacharya, and she fell unconscious. <laughs> so they were both laying there. And all the devotees were very happy. Haribo! Haribo! They were very happy. And Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was sitting on the throne watching. And he was laughing. And then when Sachimata came up, 
He said, now, Sachi Mata, I give you Krishna Prema. And then devotees were very happy. Now one may wonder, what offense did Sachi Mata do? Shall I tell? <laughs> thank you, thank you. It's a very interactive class. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Vishwarup was the elder brother of Vishwambar, or Lord Chaitanya the son of Jagannath Mishra and Sachi. He had no inclination toward materialistic life. It is described that one day, um, Jagannath Mishra brought Vishwarup to an assembly of learned Brahmin pundits. Now Vishwarup, he's actually none different than Nityananda Prabhu. He's an expansion. And he was so thoroughly learned in the scriptures. And he was an ocean of divine qualities. So humble, so gentle. Everyone loved him. But he was, he was just a boy. So Lord Shay, I mean, the Brahmins, they asked him, please tell us, what do you study? And he didn't really want to have so much of a dialogue with them because he saw they were quite mundane and they had no devotion to Krishna. <laughs> so he said, I study a little of everything. They, they were silent. And on the way home, Jagannath Mishra was very disturbed with Vishwarup. What kind of answer was that? That was not respecting the Brahmins. They asked you, why didn't you tell them the books that you studied? That's what they wanted to hear. What is this, a little of everything? That's no answer at all. Not only have you offended the Brahmins, but you have put a black spot on my good name. So Vishwarup went back to those Brahmins. He said, you asked question? Whatever other questions you may have asked me, I'll answer them. So they began to talk. And then he said, shall I tell you what I understand? They said, yes. And he spoke some amazing philosophy. Amazing philosophy. They were spellbound. And then he said, actually, can any of you defeat what I have said? They said, impossible. It's all based on logic and scripture and... He said, well, what I said is not what I really believe. <laughs> and then he systematically defeated everything he said previously. They said, he said, do you agree with this? They said, of course, how can anyone disagree with that? He said, well, actually, I don't even agree with it. <laughs> and then he defeated all of that stuff. And then he, kept, he kept defeating his own arguments. And they were just sitting there totally silent. They, how could anyone be have such brilliance? And then in the end, he reestablished his original statement. <laughs> this was Vishwarup. But Vishwarup had no inclination whatsoever for idle gossip, prajalpa. Srila Prabhupada says about prajalpa. Prajalpa means discussing mundane subjects with no real um, purpose to please God. And especially fault finding and gossip. Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami says, you can understand who is really a devotee of Nityananda Prabhu by the quality that they have no inclination to find faults with others. Now, 
so much gossip. And you know what gossip is about. You know, what this person has done and what that person has done and what everyone else is doing and all these things. Vishwaru couldn't tolerate listening to these things. And he was hearing people, even great scholars, pundits, they were describing the scriptures, but they had no devotion to Krishna. It was all just academic analysis of Sanskrit and competition of who can analyze more profoundly. It broke his heart. Even those who were teaching Bhagavad Gita. Nobody said anything about devotion to Krishna, which is the only purpose of Bhagavad Gita, to inspire devotion to Krishna. So Vishwarup, he found Advaita Charya and that Sangam, Srivas Thakur, they were constantly glorifying Krishna. At the time, very interesting, Advaita Charya was giving classes on the Yoga Vashishta. Now Yoga Vashishta, of Vashishta Muni, is generally interpreted to be impersonal. But Sri Adwaita Prabhu was describing every word of every sloka to glorify the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And that was just so brilliant. So Vishwarup, he just remained with Adwaita Charya. He didn't want to see anything or anyone else. And he was there so much. And meanwhile, Sachi is cooking nice prasad for him. Bengali prasad. <laughs> the best. And from the, from the hands of Sachimata, can you imagine Yashoda, Lord Chaitanya's mother, cooking prasad with pure love and devotion? How many of you would not come home on time for that? <laughs> You're all waiting for me to end class so you can get prasad <laughs> that the devotees cook today. I could sense it. Can you imagine if Sachimata personally cooked the prasad today? Twenty Six Second Avenue. Srila Prabhupada personally cooked the whole feast every Sunday. He cooked prasad every day sometimes for devotees. With all his love and devotion, he would, he, would, he would go out and buy the food. He would cut the vegetables. He would roll the dough. He would put it in the pots and put in the spices. He would prepare a wonderful feast. He would make kichoris and chutney and halava and rice and samosas, and malpura. And he would make puris and aromatic dal and all sorts of sabjis and ladu. <laughs> and always sweet rice, paramana. He would make all of those things with his own hands. And then he would personally offer it to Krishna. And then he would personally come down to the storefront and serve it with his own hands to all these crazy people. <laughs> some of them had long hair, some of them were unbathed, some of them were... Uh, I'm intoxicated with alcohol or, or ganja or LSD. Some of them were coming in holding hands with their boyfriends and their girlfriends. And Prabhupada's serving them. All this prasad, he would spend so many hours cooking. And the result? The Hare Krishna movement. <laughs> 
the hippies became happies by that prasad <laughs> from the hands of Srila Prabhupada. That is the power of his love. Now my question to you, how many of you would be eager to get prasad directly cooked and offered by Srila Prabhupada? I remember one time in the community I was staying in Vrindavan. Devotees wanted to learn how to make rasgulas. So they asked if Prabhupada would teach. So he said, Yes, yes, I will teach. He said, Get me some milk. They made the milk into curd, paneer and then he kneaded it, and then he rolled it in balls, and then he, you know, he made, he, he boiled water and all of this, and then he put the paneer in the water, and somehow or other, each ball that he put in just, whoop, <laughs> within seconds, it just went, whoop, it just blew up. It was about 20, 20 pieces in there, and whoop, and everyone was going, whoop. <laughs> Everyone who was watching was going, <laughs> It was amazing, unbelievable. And they're all just rolling around, these big inflated balls of paneer curd. They're just rolling around in the water. Yes, it's so beautiful. And then he said, so now you just keep rolling them around for, a, for about five more minutes and then they'll be finished. And he gave the spoon to one devotee and left. As soon as that devotee put the spoon in the water, all the balls went <laughs> How that happened was amazing. It was amazing. It went And they're trying to make them go up again. And it just went It came like raisins. Srila Prabhupada Ki So even when he's teaching us how to make rasgulas, he's teaching us how to be humble. Because that's actually the process of making rasgulas. You have to be humble. 